everyone. Labor Day has come and gone, and now it's officially time for all things autumn. Well, except for pumpkin spice everything. And we are so excited to have Maude Newton and Rebecca Donner here to discuss Maude's book, Ancestor Trouble, Gene Genealogical Research, How Family Histories Connect to Systemic Histories and More. Genealogy, once just a hobby and now a multi-billion dollar industry has become increasingly more popular with everyone getting their DNA tested and using ancestry services to find their roots. You saw this little survey that was up earlier and we're gonna bring it back up now. Have you researched your family and where are their roots? Out there for the wind so far, which is not too surprising, the mother country and in honor of the queen, we'll, uh, we'll go with that. Um, I, I think uh, the, uh, the research has shown that most people uh, who have done research on their families, these are the countries that they are from. So, um, and it's probably just because there's not material available to research in, in like Asia um, so much as there is in Europe. So Maud is a writer and a critic and Ancestor Trouble, A Reckoning and Reconciliation is her first book. It has been called a literary feat by the New York Times Book Review and a brilliant mix of personal memoir and cultural observation by the Boston Globe. Praised by Oprah Winfrey and Oprah Daly and NPR, the New York Times, Vanity Fair, Vulture, the Los Angeles Times, Wired and many others. And was named one of Esquire's best books of 2022. Excerpts of the book have appeared in Esquire Time and the Wall Street Journal. Rebecca Donner is the author of the instant New York Times bestseller, All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days, which won the 2022 National Book, National Book Critics Circle Award. And for biography, the 2022 Penn Award, Jacqueline Bograd Weld Award, 2022 Chattaqua Prize and was the finalist for the Los Angeles Book Prize and the Plutarch Award. Uh, Rebecca is also a festival alumni. What year were you here, Rebecca? I was trying to remember. It's been a what year? I believe it was 2017. I was actually talking with people about my book in progress at that time. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that was it. 2016? It's possible 2016. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So. I'm going to turn it over to Maude and to uh, to Rebecca right now, and I'm going to leave for a little bit, and I'll be back. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I, it's it's such a pleasure to be here <laughs> with Maude. I, I think we're we're reversing roles now because uh, I, when I launched my book, Maude um, was uh, was there with me uh, to launch my book, and now here I am. Um, with Maud uh, after her book has been launched and now it's in paperback and and I'm just so happy to be um, in in conversation with her again. I um, I could not be more honored that you're here. I mean, this book is you can see that both books actually incorporate <laughs> archival materials in the cover, um, and you know both have some family photos and and other information inside. Um, but, you know, Rebecca's book uh, is just, you know, really incredibly beautifully written. And she's joining us from Berlin right now, uh, where the German edition of her book, the translation, um, has launched. And, you know, it's, there are so many themes, I think, that are both in common, you know, research, obviously, family histories, you know, the unearthing of family histories, the suppression, and the interconnection, um, you know, between our own families and the larger, um, you know, histories and sort of tendencies of a culture. So I'm really grateful to you for making the time for doing oh, this. 
It's my pleasure. Thank you, Maude. Um, I uh, and and uh, I for those of you watching, I'm I'm this is not my home. Yes, I'm in I'm in Berlin. Um, so this is this rather austere background. I, I have no books even to I, I I wish I could hold up Maude's book, but I, I brought it electronically. Um, but I I just uh, um, uh, anyway, so I'm 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 making do here in, in this uh, sublet in Neukölln and uh, and yeah, I've been thinking about, as I've been walking around Berlin, thinking about um, just the history in the streets. For me, I think about my great great aunt um, and uh, who I wrote about in my in my book, Mildred Harnock. And uh, one of the things that I've done while I was writing this book um, over the years is walk around, take trips here and think about the neighborhoods where she walked um, and uh, where she lived. And then after her death, um, uh, I've been thinking about commemoration um, and honoring legacy. And she has um, something called a Stolperstein. It's a, it translates as a stumbling stone. And um, this is, um, this is uh, basically a, a project, a public arts project by uh, an artist, Gunter Demnig. And he wanted to commemorate people who were persecuted by the Nazi regime. So you see these brass stones all around Berlin. It's a project that now has expanded into many other countries. Um, but the, the brass stones basically uh, have the person's name and the birth date and death. And, and the idea behind it is that you can't just walk through Berlin without feeling and confronting the past, you in fact have to stumble over the past, stumble over these stones. And I feel like it's it's such a, a, an important public arts project to remind people of the past. We can't just simply forget it. We can't bury it. We must confront it. Every time we walk into the streets, um, and we must be reminded about what happened here. And so Maude, I was thinking about you and, and how you write about your ancestors and and your instinct to not to bury the past, but to exhume the past. And I'd love to, you to talk a little bit about that. You know, you have this, uh, many people do try to bury the past um, as a way of, of moving on emotionally. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and yet you found great value in, in, in digging into your past. And, and um, how was that? I, you know why? Why was that your instinct to really go deep into um, your genealogy, where you knew that there were a lot of dark secrets, or you had this instinct um, that, that there were things that you might discover that you may not like to see? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, on the one hand, I grew up um, hearing these really sort of larger than life tales from my mother. My mother is Texan. And she and my grandmother were amazing storytellers. Um, and between the two of them, I heard about my mom's father who died before I was born, but supposedly married 13 times. Um, I have found a mere 10 marriages to nine women so far. Um, and then his father was said to have killed a man with a hay hook. Um, and, you know, that seemed very implausible, but also knowing my family, not impossible. Uh, so I had conjured this sort of image of my great grandfather as this um, drunken hothead. And in fact, the story that I unearthed about him as I began uh, researching this was, was much more sympathetic. Um, so that was sort of on my mother's side, um, there were definitely things that were hidden, but there was also this sort of family enjoyment. I think in the book, later in the book, I talk about it as, as a sort of perverse nostalgia for painful things. Um, you know, on my father's side, um, you know, my father's family is from the Mississippi Delta, um, and my father is an overt white supremacist. So. I grew up with him advocating for slavery uh, because our ancestors had enslaved people, black people. Um, his sort of take on it was that our ancestors were inherently correct and therefore this was a correct and benevolent institution. So, you know, obviously 
that was a difficult thing to grow up with, uh, mm -hmm. a very toxic sort of belief for him to try to um, inculcate uh, in me and, and my sibling. But um, at the same time, I didn't have the luxury that a lot of people whose ancestors participated in the slavery system have of looking the other way. I had to have a relationship to it. I, you know, it was a theme for him to the extent that he would cover over black children in my storybooks with nail polish. That and was such an interesting detail that you talked about uh, and, and how the, the pages would stick together. So there were almost these gaps in the story. You would skip a page, um, which I thought was really a, a, um, a, a fascinating uh, image. Um, and, and this is a kind of, it's not a burying, but it's a, it, it's a, an om omission, you know, um, that act of, of erasure really, uh, you know, in, in painting over faces with, with a nail polish of black people who he just didn't want to see in these storybooks that he was yeah, reading. Yeah, he was very uh, concerned that my sister and I not get the notion that it was okay for black people and white people to associate with each other. Yeah. Uh, he was a really ardent segregationist. And I was growing up in Miami and I'm, I'm very um, you know, grateful for that too because the prevailing vibe in my childhood, I was born in 1971 and the prevailing vibe in Miami, there was a lot of racism, but it wasn't that kind of racism. And mm -hmm. so you know, I, there wasn't really a sort of um, cultural context for his beliefs that that reinforced them, and I'm and I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, I mean, I write you know about all of this obviously at so much length in the book, but I have really come to believe that it's very important, um, you know, on an individual level to look at these stories that often have a way of you know, themes have a way of showing up in our own lives. Um, we don't sort of confront them open heartedly and in a true way. And, you know, on a cultural level, um, you know, I have come to believe that it's really important for those of us who come from these histories, whose ancestors participated in these kinds of harms to be transparent about those histories. And by that, I don't mean that we go to our black friends and we unburden ourselves about our family's history of slavery, but that we say to other people who don't, who aren't aware um, of those histories in their own families or in the country, hey, this is what my ancestors did. And, and this is how I feel about that. And this is how I see those histories, um, you know, continuing in the world that we're living in now. And, and so, you know, one thing that I was really excited to talk with you about is, um, you know, as I mentioned, my father's side of the family was very into secrecy around details, especially his mom, very mm -hmm. sort of Southern, not on board with his way of viewing things, but just a sort of like, let's look on the bright side, let's not talk about difficult things kind of person. Um, and I know that you experienced that in your own family. And so I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Oh, sure, yes. Well, I, I think growing up, I was aware of my great, great aunts as a kind of spectral presence, you know, that I, and there was a kind of a haunting. Um, and I knew that there was a story there that was somehow uncomfortable for the adults around me. Um, uh, later, I would find out that she was uh, beheaded on Hitler's direct order for her participation in um, an underground resistance group in Berlin and as the only American in, in the leadership of that group. Um, but you know, these, uh, that explanation was not supplied to me when I was a child. What I did sense though was in my great grandmother, Harriet, uh, who was Mildred's eldest sister, I sensed at, at, at the age of nine, this um, 
just this brittleness in her and this anger and this sadness and, and a sort of a complexity of emotions um, that, that, that told me at the age of nine, um, when I asked her, uh, you know, about Mildred, uh, she, she, she would not tell me, um, but I sensed at that age that there was a story there. And it, it, for me, the mystery of Mildred began right then. And I, I, I wanted to know more, but I, I knew the adults wouldn't tell me. And I, I had to grow up a little bit. And, and when I was 16, my grandmother told me more and she was very transparent. You know, she was very forthcoming. And I, I was, uh, she gave me Mildred's letters and she urged me to write Mildred's story one day. And she knew I wanted to be a writer. Um, and so I promised her that I would. It, it, and it felt like a gift and an and I don't want to say an obligation, but but a, a responsibility um, to tell the story. And um, and I I wanted to ask you about that too, about the, the responsibility that you may have that that you clearly felt, you know, in in the sense that you wanted to be uh, you believe in transparency, you believe in 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 talking about these that the. the um, difficult aspects of, of, of family's history. Um, but I, I, before we go more into that, I just, I had this other thought about, um, uh, that actually didn't really even occur to me until I started thinking uh, about this talk with you and, and trying to think about the, the, the overlapping themes. And I was thinking about how, when I was 16, when my grandmother gave me those letters, and I've described this in numerous events. So I'm, I'm sort of, um, uh, I, I, but I hadn't quite thought about how, um, the, the, how there was something about how she said to me, um, you remind me of Mildred and, and I remember feeling very flattered, uh, you know, well, tell me more. And, and what was she like? And she said, oh, well, she liked literature and she, um, and, and there was, there's just a sort of kind of, um, uh, like vivaciousness that I had uh, that she said, you know, that you're just like Mildred. And, and yet, um, as, as I started writing this book, I started thinking about the myth, myth making that, that we uh, also make in fam you know, that we have in families. And I was thinking about how, how she needed to also see Mildred and me. I think she was giving me something. I was inheriting these letters and I was inheriting the story and she was kind of imbuing me with these qualities um, that, that belonged to my great, great aunt. Um, as I researched Mildred more and I started reading about what other people, how they described her, I thought, I'm kind of not like that, I, you know, her mannerisms and some of these other things uh, um, I, in the sense that at least when she was in Germany, you know, um, she was very reserved and very, um, she spoke softly, but clearly, but she was uh, sort of a woman of few words. Uh, uh, and, and that resulted in her uh, being, people would listen. Uh, Martha Dodd, the ambassador's daughter talked about how um, when she did speak, people listen because she she didn't speak often. I don't have that problem. <laughs> I talk, you know, I'm rather garrulous. And and so, uh, or it's not a problem. It's just, a, a, um, I should say, uh, it's just a, a characteristic. And and so, um, but, I, but I was thinking about how by telling me this, at, you know, when I was a teenager, it connected me to the story in a way that I felt like, uh, I, I mean, I certainly was fascinated but, and had been for a while um, by the story of my great great aunt, but by but but by telling me by basically the inheritance that was that, that you know what I was inheriting was this story about how I was in a way registered to me at that time there was almost a genetic inheritance you know and 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 that and that my grandmother almost needed to see that as a way of passing the story to me. And, and, and again, I think that that's, there, there are some, there is a kind of storytelling there and a myth-making um, that's a part of that, um, um, you know, passing on this, this, um, this story to me. And, and so, you know, I, I'm just curious about how um, this points to the stories that we tell each other. And in your book, you say the stories we tell each other about our ancestors have the power 
to shape us in some ways nearly as much as our genetics do. And so let's talk about storytelling and, and, and in your life, you know, how were you shaped by these stories that you heard growing up and how has the act of writing this book, how has that changed the stories um, or expanded upon them? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question. And so my, my mom's mother, my beloved, um, Texan granny uh, told me when I was young that I reminded me of, or that I, in appearance, reminded her of her sister with my dark hair. And she always spoke so wistfully of her sister, mm -hmm. uh, my great aunt Louise. And uh, later I learned that Louise had died in a mental institution. Um, and I learned this because I was 12 and my grandmother um, warned me to be on the lookout for signs of mental illness in myself and my own sibling and any children I might have, which was a really sort of heavy thing to take on. And it was already a, a very difficult sort of time in my life for, for various reasons. And so, um, you know, that, that was definitely something that I, um, I already had that fear about mental illness, sort of having observed my mother and being aware of my own sort of extreme tendencies at times. And so yeah, so that definitely created this sense of a sort of uh, blurring, you know, of the past and the present. And almost it sounds like an uh, there's a kind of inexorable or sort of inevitability that that you are destined to, or there's something genetically programmed in you. You you write about how there were numerous suicides in your family, and your mother attempted suicide, and 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 you have family members who died in mental institutions and. Um, there was schizophrenia in, in one member of your family or somebody was diagnosed with. Yeah, yeah that was that aunt. And yeah, so oh, that was her. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so, but I would imagine that then also with a, with this sense of, of DNA as being something that's hard coded and that cannot be changed, uh, that there's this sense of that, that it's just your destiny, especially at a young age, if you don't understand the subtleties involved um, and and the complexities involved with inheritance and and um, and 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 DNA and and yeah, I mean, doesn't does not determine. Yeah, I really did. You know, that's one reason that I. So you know, as you know in the book, there's sort of a lot about my family, but then interspersed with it um, are different sections that sort of go become a lot more broad and so one of the things that I really wanted to take a look at um, was this idea of intergenerational trauma uh, you know, epigenetic changes um, you know sort of rather than changes to the DNA itself changes to the expression of our genes and the debate in the scientific community around whether those changes can be transmitted to later generations. And of course, you know, in the culture, that's taken as a given now that, you know, that we've had these sort of studies about um, epigenetics, but there is a lot of doubt um, among hard scientists uh, uh, as to whether that happens with humans. And so, you know, even though my, you know, sort of gut tells me that it does, I really wanted to take a look at the research, take a look at the questions we're asking, questions we we aren't asking, and and really lay that out for the reader. And I and to your point, I think my intense interest in that sort of question about um, what is destined to come down to us? You know, what do we determine on our own? And what is this sort of like gray area in the middle? Um, you know, I can definitely date my fascination with that back to, you know, in part my grandmother's warning about mental illness. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, sort of a related point back to that 
um, quote from my book that you mentioned, you know, what I what I said there is that the stories we tell ourselves about our ancestors have the power to shape us in some ways as much as our genetics do. And of course, those stories, as you say, are are based on what we've heard, um, yeah. what we've been told. But, you know, one sort of, um, you know, I mentioned the earlier example of my great grandfather who was said to have killed the man with the hay hook. And I had pictured this sort of out of control, um, you know, swashbuckling hothead when in fact he, that wasn't the scenario. Um, and what I discovered is that a, a former friend had attacked him. Um, probably because of testimony that my great grandfather gave in a trial in which the friend was accused of uh, trying to rape his, his own, the friend's stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. And so, but on the other hand, you know, I always had this idea, I always affiliated myself with my mother's family, sort of um, emotionally and spiritually, if you will. And you know, I was interested in uncovering the histories of my father's family and, and by extension, my history through that. But on my mother's side, I really viewed my grandmother as this person who had pulled herself up by her bootstraps, come out of adversity, came from generations of poverty, you know, definitely was not the kind of person who was descended from enslavers, you know, I told myself. And in fact, I found that history on her side as well. And so that was an opportunity for me to, you know, I had always been a little bit, you know, as I grew older, I was a little smug, honestly, about my willingness to acknowledge these histories and puzzled by other people's reticence. But when I found this on that line, um, I understood more, you know, how how hard it is to find that history, you know, on a line that that you relate to in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I feel like that connects to, you know, I know you're, you know, as you've discussed, your great grandmother was so interested in burying Mildred's story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there was a reticence on the part of the United States government to share her story. You write about that. And, um, you know, the story is only now really fully being told, thanks to you. I know there have been other attempts and, and partial um, versions of it. But, um, yeah, I just, I, I'm really interested in people like your great aunt. Mm -hmm decide to step up, you know, who decide to um, really, you know, put themselves in jeopardy, um, you know, in when they notice that that things around them are wrong. I, it's it's a tremendously inspiring story to me, um, I think, and, uh, and, and has informed um, my life in in some ways when I, I I growing up with this story knowing that I had this great great aunt who made this choice um, to join the resistance as an American in a foreign country and um, and risk her life and and lose her life in doing so um, it does put things in perspective when when facing something difficult uh, and 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 thinking you know. Um, should I stand up for my, you know, I, I've never faced anything like that in my life before, that kind of decision um, and 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 those kinds of struggles. But I I have felt um inspired and empowered by that 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 story of her. Um and I think that um I I, I again going back to storytelling, I think that you know in in your book, um, you, you interrogate this question of who are we? What are we made of? You know, the stories, and, and there's this idea of the stories of the past, the stories of your ancestors, and then and then what you do with those stories and 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 there's and and the inheritance of these stories. And and there are several different kinds of inheritance, of course, and you write about them um so beautifully. And there's there's one that we've been talking about, these sort of like 
physical traits and be and behaviors, you know, the color of your hair or tendencies towards uh, certain sort of psychological uh, sort of predilections. And then there's physical and physical objects that you inherit. And you talk about that as well. Um, and you know, I'm thinking about your great grandmother, uh, Mama T's gold ring with the filigree, and um, and how you you got it when you were 16, and then you and you kept it on your finger and didn't take it off, and then at some point you did, and lost it um, uh, when you were 30, and and um, and and then you and of course that's upsetting because that this is this piece of your past, and it's it's something that you're ancestors touched and held on their uh war on their I mean, your mama t your great grandmother war on her finger and it's a sort of that that physical um object connects you um to your past and then you write, write about the rocking chair and the, and and there are uh, at the crocheted bedspread and and the cookbook and 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 i'm wondering about you know and each of these objects has a story and by putting them in your home, you also get a chance to shape that narrative about those about those objects. So I'm wondering if when these objects, when you received them, um, were there stories about them that weren't the complete story or the, or that or sort of these objects were imbued with some kind of quality? Uh, what were the stories about these objects? and then and then how did you did you, now that they're surrounding you or things that you've lost um, um, or things that you have now, how have you, how have you shaped the narrative about those objects? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And in fact, right here behind me, I have a, <laughs> that my grandmother, oh, nice. <laughs> so I put that on <laughs> It's chilly, which it hasn't been recently, but I, I like the way it looks. And actually, the, the cover of my book um, is intended to evoke the quilts that uh, my grandmother made, um, which are very important to me. And, you know, there, there are some writers in my family background, but none that I'm descended from, um, as far as I know. And so, you know, something that's really kind of come to me as I've looked for um, sort of precedence for my writing in my ancestors is my grandmother's sort of piecing together of her quilts. You know, I remember when I was a child you know, we would go to the Goodwill all the time. Um, that was like the main place where she bought everything. Um, and of course, when you're a child, that's magnificent. Um, and we would look through the men's pajamas uh, to see if we could find the color that she wanted for the quilts. And so, mm. you know, it was helpful to me over time to just sort of um, think about the kinship there uh, or, you know, another of my ancestors, several of my, most of my ancestors actually were um, involved in some way in farming or cultivation of plants, in some cases through the plantation system, um, and then uh, in other cases through subsistence farming. And so thinking about that kind of cultivation, um, you know, helpful in connection with the writing, but with the um, objects themselves, for the most part, I do feel this kind of deep, you know, almost spiritual connection to them. But I can't think of any, apart from the photographs and the documents and, you know, that have a very clear um, sort of um, significance uh, and I'll show you, actually, I'll show everyone the only photo I have of my mom's mother and father together, which I think probably captures a lot about their relationship. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but she doesn't look super happy in the <laughs> um, So, yeah, I, you know, those are things that have taken on this um, 
you know, mm. sort of mythological quality to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm i thinking about, it, it sort of puts me in mind of, of um, yeah, Edmund Duval's, uh, that gorgeous memoir that he wrote, The Hair with the Amber Eyes, and he talks about his family's rise to prominence through World War II and 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 the Nazis seized their palace in Vienna and stole all their possessions except for this collection of these 264 little um, exquisite miniature um, sculptures uh, from from Japan um, called Netsuke, and and it, it was because a, a maid hid hid these presumably under a mattress or that was the method that was sort of the the story passed down to him about why they survived in it and. Um, and 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 he writes about how um, you know cl he clearly treasures um, these objects, but there is a kind of um, uh, you know he's he's in, he's entrusted with these, and there is a kind of responsibility that 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 he is given in 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 the way that when you were given the the, the ring or when you when you inherit these objects, you know there is a there is a responsibility to um, care for them, and then you know perhaps pass them down to somebody and and there I do write about a cross that I was given that I yeah never wore and I felt um was not for me and so I passed that along to another descendant of my dad's mom um you know in a way that felt sort of in keeping with the spirit in which she gave it to me but also a way of releasing the sort of what i felt as a, a sort of implied obligation around around the cross um, right yeah yeah that was that was a very when when i realized that that was something i could do with it 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 felt really great to release it in that way yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm curious about what you have over the course of, of the, the year um, uh, and in talking and, and getting, I'm sure, a lot of email and, and messages um, from readers uh, who share their stories about their families and, and the ways that in which they have been either trapped or liberated um, by, you know, exhuming the past. Um, what, what are the kinds that, can you share some of the stories that are sort of, that, that might be, um, um, the same types of stories that keep coming up? Uh, are, are, are there, are there some kind of, um, trends that you see in, in terms of what people share with you? Um, and I'm particularly interested in, in trauma, you know, and how this idea of trauma in families informs the present. Yeah, definitely. And I see that some of the questions that we have here really connect so well to this question of yours. You know, one person asks, do either of you feel judged for what happened in your families? And another person says, um, you know, that they have some rough stories that they feel need to be told. And how do you balance the viewpoint without judging the actions or do you judge them? Um, and, you know, I think a lot of us are sort of grappling with, you know, in, in different ways, we don't all come to it in the way that I did, but a lot of us want to tell these stories. Um, we want to be honest, but maybe also we feel some reticence around, well, you know, I don't want to hurt this person or, you know, how can I tell this story and be fair to this person and also to my my own viewpoint, um, you know, or in the case of trauma, you know, um, how do you, you know, people often will share, you know, stories of their own family traumas with me. Um, I was curious about that, yeah. Yeah, and then they, you know, and then we have a, a meaningful conversation about how to how to write about that you know even if people don't consider themselves writers uh you know i think a lot of people are driven to write accounts you know for the family mm -hmm. uh, you know if, if not sort of for broader publication and you know 
I mean, I've spent many, many years um, writing about my own family. I tried to fictionalize some of it at one time. And now I'm working on a novel that's mercifully not about my family. And that, that feels really great. But, um, you know, when I was younger, I really sort of approached the writing in an attitude of judgment, I would say. Um, and sort of, you know, as sort of typical of an artist of, of our generation, you know, I'm Gen X, so I wanted to sort of like expose the ugliness and expose um, the superficiality and the hypocrisy and, and all of this. Um, and, you know, as I've gotten older, that has continued to be important to me. Um, but with a sort of different kind of um, compassion, sort of for myself and my own failings around mm -hmm. all of that, um, you know, for in many cases, my ancestors themselves, you know, um, my father, for example, I have a very hard time understanding my father. Um, yeah ways and and we are estranged but I have also spent a lot of time sort of trying to understand his why he is the way he is and and how maybe he feels sort of internally um and you know yeah so so that's been important to me to sort of like um bring both um honesty you know, to bear on the story um, and a, a determination to like really get in there and find everything I can. And I think like you, I mean, there has been a lot of digging around. Um, you know, there was ancestry.com and free ancestry sites, and newspaper sites, and as it happened, you know, court um published court opinions you know and legal documents and and all kinds of um you know sort of things that i didn't expect to be able to find so so that but then also sort of bringing in my own failings and my own feelings and um you know trying to be fair you know to yeah to other people, not writing in a spirit of ax grinding, um, but also remaining firm in my um, willingness to, to tell the truth. So, now, is that something that um, evolved in the process of writing this book? Did it start out being um, tonally different and then you started to modify the way that you were thinking about approaching it or was this always something was this always the spirit in which you approached this material no well it, it definitely wasn't the way that I approached the material historically but once I began writing this as a book yeah. that very much so I wrote a piece for Harper that was published in 2014 um, and it focused more on my father um, it was you know a lot less wide-ranging than the book and um, yeah by the time I started working on it as a book in 2014 I had already settled on this approach you know many years of therapy, many years of meditation on top of many years of writing and just life and contemplating my family. Um, all of those were really helpful. And, you know, I think that's one thing we can feel a real sense of urgency to tell these stories, you know, at many points in our lives. But I think you and I are kind of an example of how the stories will come at the time that you know that they're ready to come yeah yeah I, I believe that very much so um I just want to pause right now and just tell everybody who's watching to please um write in your questions um for Maude um and uh and and me um if you want to address 
anything that's come up in our, in our discussion, um, please do uh, feel free to, to write uh, the questions in the Q&A and, and we can respond to them. Um, and we have about a little over 10 minutes basically. So um, uh, uh, we can incorporate your questions into our discussion. Um, I think um, uh, we have one question, which is, uh, do, do either of you feel judged about what happened in your families? Can, is there something, can you address? Yeah, that? yeah. yeah. Um, so sometimes, yeah, um, in, in various ways, um, you know, and I, I think it's appropriate, um, you know, for my ancestors to be judged, you know, by me and others for enslaving other human beings. Um, you know, my ancestors also participated in the displacement and killing of indigenous people um, in Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, for example. I, to my great surprise, I thought my whole family was Southern in this country. And I discovered that I was descended from um, Mary Parsons of Northampton, who is a sort of uh, historical figure of note there because she was accused of being a witch and she beat the charges. Um, and so, you know, when I first discovered this, I was pretty excited. Yeah. <laughs> religious extremism in my family. And so this kind of felt like an interesting um, sort of call back to that. My mother was always, uh, well, for much of my childhood, very obsessed with Satan and evil spirits. And so, you know, this, this was very interesting to me. Um, but then over time, as I learned more about Mary, who I do have admiration for, um, as someone who dealt with a lot of persecution in her own life, I realized that that family also persecuted, um, you know, which is, I think, more often than not the case, you know, if we, um, if we don't, you know, if we're in a difficult environment and we're not able to sort of work through things, we're more likely to, um, you know, enact the same kinds of harms on others that we ourselves are experiencing. And so when we find ourselves in a place where we're able to, you know, to make changes in our lives and, and, and whatnot, I, I really do believe it's important to, um, yeah, to exhume all of that, you know, mm -hmm. to, to sort of harken back to the um, sort of death spirits metaphor there and, um, you know, and, and just drag it all out into the daylight, you know, I mean, of course, there are certain things I didn't write about because of family members who are living, um, you know. I was going to ask you that, yes, who did you, who did you, which stories did you I mean, there's always a process of editing you know, your book. You you can't tell every story in your family. And so you, you want to focus on some, but in focusing on some rather than others, were there stories that you decided not to tell because of some sense um, that that uh, it, that you you know wanted to protect the person or you felt that there was, uh, so there's a question here about um, somebody asks, I have rough stories that I feel need to be told. How do you, how do you, um, how do you balance the viewpoint without judging the actions, or do you judge them? These are two different questions, really. But, but, um, uh, but, but there is a kind of an overlap in the sense that you have a, a something that's difficult, perhaps, um, in a story that you want to tell. How do you either tell it, or um, how do you choose to, um, in, in in a way that's objective without judging, um, uh, is the question. Or, uh, and a related question um, is were there times when there was a so-called rough story that you chose not to tell and why? Yeah, so, um, you know, I write explicitly in the book about, you know, not, you know, omitting my sister from the book to the greatest degree possible, you know, um, 
And obviously she's my sibling, so it wasn't really possible to, to leave her out of it altogether, but she's a much more private person than I am. And I wanted to respect that. Um, you know, and, the, and there are other stories, um, you know, that maybe I heard the story, but I don't have personal knowledge of it. And so it could wander into the realm of defamation if it weren't mm -hmm. true. And, you know, um, yeah, so, so there are a lot of considerations, I think, for a writer. But at the same time, I, I hope this doesn't sound grandiose, but I'm committed to a, a certain level of fearlessness. Um, you know, I want to write about things compassionately, um, but, you know, as I say in the book, you know, it's sort of a joke, but my parents knew from my very early childhood that I wanted to be a writer and they chose to behave as they did anyway you know, and so <laughs> they sort of left me to deal with that reality um, with the tools that they knew I had. So, you know. What is that? Is it Anne Lamott who says, um, you know, if um, if people are upset about you writing about them, they should have behaved better? But have you heard this? Yeah, I thought that sounds right. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so. I think it's Anne Lamott. Anyway, I'm always <laughs> amused by that. <laughs> You know, it's sort of whether they should have behaved better, probably, but at this point, it's sort of like that ship has sailed. Now right. here we are, and I am a writer, as I told you, I was going to be, so. Right. <laughs> uh, and you have such an incredible um, memory, too, for these um uh, just expressions that that various family members have um, that are just so lively, and I think about that. That is, you know, a very a, a writerly tendency to kind of hold on to these um, very sort of pithy expressions. And and can you can you um, uh, can can you share some of them with us? There was there was one about uh, I, I think I, uh, was he a great grandfather who whose house was so cold when he walked across it, uh, his mustache froze. Um, yeah. some yeah. of these stories. <laughs> yeah, that one was actually from a newspaper article. Uh, that oh, was okay. Yeah, my, yeah. Uh, father. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my Texan grandmother had a lot of choice expressions, some of which you can read in the book, but I won't share here, um, mm -hmm. you know, because they do involve a certain amount of profanity. But uh, she would say things like, he was quiet as a little mouse peeing on cotton. I, I sort of lost I my that one. Yeah. Texan accent, so I apologize to the Texans here. Um, but uh, yeah, so, but I think you're right for a certain kind of person, especially a person who grows up knowing that they want to write or sort of being prone to that kind of rumination. There yeah. is sort of like, holding on to memory, right. holding on to language. That um, was my sense in reading your book that, and, and you're, because you're quoting family members as saying things to you when you were a child and, and when you were an adolescent and, and they, um, they're just these very vivid, um, either recollections or, um, you know, very, um, colorful, shall we say, um, um, expressions that were shared with you. Um, and, and you held on to them that you know you carried those those um those descriptions with you um as as you know through the years and and uh and it makes for a you know a, just a fascinating read oh thank you so much and you know i see in the comments that a lot of people are asking about um writing novels and you know sort of um you know, fiction versus nonfiction and, um, and the sort of complexities around that. And, and I wanted to just recommend that people consider reading Alexander Chi's uh, essay collection, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, um, you know, because he really gets at um, it's a lot of the stuff around fiction versus nonfiction. Um, you know, and um, 
Yeah, and I, you know, I really feel for the the folks in this um, Q and A who are are taking this on because it is it can be a lot to sort of wrestle with all of this and and figure out how to tell these kinds of stories, as you well know. Yeah, um, definitely. And and that question about whether to fictionalize it uh, or whether to um, or, or whether to not or to do something in between and and do a kind of a um, a hybrid genre um, is 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 a very um, is an important choice to make as a writer. And I think I it, it, I'm curious um, as people have shared in the Q and A about deciding to write about their families, but in a, um, in a fictional way. Um, did you ever think about doing that uh, for Ancestor Trouble? Did you ever think, oh, this is a novel and then, and then decide, no, it's not a novel, it, it's a memoir? I was sort of endlessly working on a novel that was and not was not based on my childhood. Um, as I wrote in my newsletter recently, I would move sort of too far away from the emotional reality of my childhood and I would move it closer, but then it was too close. So I, so I feel very freed of, of that whole dance now that I've gotten it out in nonfiction. Um, and I know some people are asking, um, you know, for th the opportunity to sort of um, follow along with both of us, you know, um, as we think about these issues outside of this conversation. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to mention, obviously, we're both on social media. Um, and, and Rebecca, um, do you have a newsletter? I don't. I feel like I should. Um, I, I love your newsletter. <laughs> I think once I once things calm down, I'm still uh, traveling around so much. Um, it's something that I'd like to do uh, because it's a great way of connecting with readers. My newsletter is called Ancestor Trouble. So yeah. it's a great I, I would definitely recommend uh, viewers to to um, sign up for it. It's it's, really by the way, so um, if you'd like to sign up. You can give it a shot and then unsubscribe if it's not for you. But thank you so much to Sandy and Jerry, um, you know, of the Brattleboro Literary Festival for having us for this cocktail hour. And Rebecca, thank you again for joining us uh, from Berlin. Oh, you're very welcome. It was thank my you, Maude and Rebecca, and, and thank everyone for joining us. And that went by really quick. <laughs> yeah, it certainly did. <laughs> So, so next month uh, on Thursday, October 13th at 7 p.m., we'll be joining Simon & Schuster's Author Fest as a prelude to the festival to present two iconic authors in conversation, John Irving and Jason Reynolds, in an all-virtual event to open the festival weekend. You can join online and registration will be available probably this week, or you can join us live to view the online event at 118 Elliott on the big screen. If you've never done that before, that might be kind of fun. And then on Friday, November 11th, we'll be back with the Literary Cocktail Hour, and it'll be Tess Gunty in her debut novel, Rabbit Hutch, which is getting huge amounts of press, and uh, like Sarah Manguso's uh, book from July. She's received incredible reviews, New York Times, The Guardian, Washington Post. It just came out August 2nd. Um, so the festival, the live festival this year, will have over 60 authors who will converge on Brattleboro, including Tom Parada, Buzz Bissinger, Alice Elliott Dark, Tilly Walden, Joshua Prager, Julia Glass, Joyce Maynard, Ben Shattuck, car cartoonists David Cypress and Harry Bliss from The New Yorker, and so many more. So for details on how to volunteer or to donate or to check out the full list of authors, uh, visit our website at www.brattleboroletfest.org. And everybody have a great week and keep reading. Thank you. Thank you.